As the patient is introduced, judge the physical condition from apparent age, build, and coloring, and notice pallor or breathlessness of any. Ask about serious illnesses in the past or any present disability. Little preparation of the patient is necessary. A tight collar is removed for comfort, or in the case of a woman, necklaces which may be soiled. The position in the chair is important. Ask the patient to sit as upright as possible so that the lower part of the spine is brought into contact with the back of the seat. Then adjust the headrest to support the neck in an almost vertical position. The headrest must be well under the occiput, feet must rest flat on the chair and not be allowed to obtain a purchase on the footrest. Normally it's unnecessary to strap a patient in the chair. For selected cases, however, where anesthesia is likely to be prolonged or the patient difficult to control, the use of a strap is justified. Place it over the top of the thighs and behind the seat of the chair. The object of the strap is to maintain the patient's pelvis against the back of the chair. Inspect the teeth to be removed and also the remaining teeth for bridge work or crowns. You will then be able to judge the probable length of anesthesia required and where it is safe to insert a prop or gag. Explain to your patient that the gas is breathed in through the nose only, and that this is not difficult although the mouth is open. Add that by taking a minute to go off, she will be more comfortable. Don't ask the patient to bite on the prop, as it suggests closing the mouth, but just to open her mouth as widely as possible. Hold the nose piece about one inch away from the nose. Talk to her from the start of the induction and encourage and praise her cooperation. Persuade your patient into nasal breathing and do not attempt to force the gas in under pressure. Nitrous oxide and no added oxygen is used during the induction, otherwise it will be unduly prolonged and the patient will get worried at nothing much happening. Urge the patient to relax, to drop the shoulders. Explain that shortly a muzzy feeling will be noticed. This is the first sign of loss of consciousness. Only when analgesia is present is the nose piece allowed to come in contact with the face. If the patient reverts to mouth breathing, try further encouragement and suggestion by resting your hand near the mouth. Mention that whilst your hand is there, the dental surgeon cannot start. If persistent mouth breathing occurs, a mouth cover with a supply of gas should be used. The onset of surgical anesthesia is indicated by the change in character of respiration. It becomes automatic and its depth is increased from slight oxygen lack. Until well established, automatic nasal breathing is obtained, the patient is not anesthetized. When nasal automatic respiration indicates that the patient is anesthetized with pure nitrous oxide, air or oxygen must be added to maintain smooth anesthesia. Air may be added by raising the nose piece, or oxygen by an adjustment of the machine. But in the latter case, your attention must not be diverted from the patient. During the induction, the dental surgeon is seated in silence or stands before the window, not poised, ready to start. Insert the throat pack so that it acts as a diaphragm, shutting off the oropharynx. Invite the dental surgeon to start by a sign. The patient may hear a remark and might respond, upsetting the smooth anesthesia. The three or four further breaths before the dental surgeon has time to start will carry her well into the stage of surgical anesthesia. Air or oxygen is added to the nitrous oxide to prevent the effects of anoxia, such as jacketation. It is rarely 
entirely possible to maintain a constant setting of the mixture as the stimulus of extraction varies throughout. The quantity is judged purely by the response of the patient. Stand behind and to the left of the dental chair with the apparatus to your left hand. Control the mixture of gases with the left hand and the rate of flow with the left foot. When lower teeth are being removed, both hands should support the mandible. For lower right molars, tilt the whole head slightly to the right and stand well over to the left of the chair, thus allowing the dental surgeon's left arm to encircle the patient's head. When upper teeth are being extracted, hold the patient's head as in a vice with both hands and in addition, use the right shoulder to oppose the upward pressure of the faucets. During the extraction of upper teeth, guard the lower lip from bruising by the faucets with your finger. When requested to change from one side of the mouth to the other, insert a mouth gag or a slightly smaller dental prop. A mouth gag can be inserted from behind with safety, provided that two fingers are used to clear the lips. The blades rest on the molar teeth and the handles are pressed well against the patient's cheek. During these maneuvers, the tone in the masseta muscles may be diminished by a temporary increase in oxygen intake. Allow the patient to recover consciousness with the spoken word as the only stimulus. Cover the eyes from the light and tell her quietly where she is and that the extractions are over. Delay the removal of the throat pack and dental prop until full consciousness is reached as the manipulations may be misinterpreted as the finish of the extraction. Cyanosis is an unreliable guide to the depth of anesthesia, for while it may be well shown in a plethoric patient, it will not occur before death in patients with anemia. The throat pack must not be inserted so far back as to press the soft palate against the posterior pharyngeal wall, occluding the nasal airway. So placed, it will irritate the pharyngeal reflex, resulting in gagging and the slipping of the dental prop. 